Welcome to class number six. I don't know why I feel a little edgy about it. It might be number seven, but uh, I trust the number is right, okay? I'm just giving a little FYI ahead in case some people write in the comments, you got the wrong number class. <laughs> okay, so we are in class number six. And last time I taught you about how to handle hurdles in soul winning. Now remember, I want to stress this over and over again. Uh, when we go through these hurdles in soul winning, don't think soul winning is that complicated. It's not hard. Okay? Uh, if you watch class number two and I think class number three, it showed you the easiness of soul winning. These hurdles rarely happen. happen. I only cover these hurdles because uh, one out of multiple people, you're going to bump into this, okay, one of these hurdles. And trust me, you're not going to come across all of these hurdles, okay? Some of them is very extremely rare. So we're going to cover these hurdles now, and I hope you don't get panicked. So we covered Romans 3.23 last time, the hurdle with that. We also covered Revelation 21.8, the hurdle with that. Then now we're at Romans chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Okay, so here's the next hurdle now. So Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through 9, it's... Ha, 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 I knew it. It's 7. Okay, there was some iffy feeling there. Okay, I caught it. People online, I caught it. Okay. So Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through 9, if you recall in your soul winning class, it's... Uh, the goal of this is to simply explain to them the story of Jesus. That way they can understand why that story is important. Why? Because at verse 9, if you look at verse 9, it talks about the blood that clears away their sin. And remember, you covered these two to show them that because of their sin, their penalties are burning hell. So Romans 5, 8, and 9 is to show the solution and answer to get rid of the sin that damns them to hell in these two passages. So this passage will show them the answer out of that, the blood of Jesus that washes away their sin. Now, the only hurdle you're probably going to come across on this one is the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is God. Now, make sure, I told you in my soul winning class number two or three, you have to stress that Jesus is God. You have to mention that. Now, you don't have to park it there for five minutes. Just make a simple statement, Jesus is God, and then ask them if they believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected uh, when we come to the Romans chapter 10, verse 9 at the sinner's prayer. But, aside from that, when you mention Jesus is God, the next hurdle you're, com you're going to come across is that they do not believe Jesus is God. So you're going to have to use verses to prove Jesus is God. Now the favorite verse to use is 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Now here's a tip that I want to add in soul winning, okay? So here's an overall tip. Never debate doctrine. You might say, well, why is that? Because your job is to get them saved, not give them Bible-believing truth. Bible-believing truth comes after salvation. The important thing is their salvation first. Now, never debate doctrine with them. The only time you debate, is it if it comes across to any disagreement with your soul winning. Now, soul winning class number two and three, I covered all the important doctrines in there, so you don't have to worry about that. If they don't believe or disagree in any of the doctrines in the soul winning that I taught you at class number two and three, not other doctrines, if they say, oh yeah, Mary is the mother of God, you know what you should do? Don't try to debunk them and argue with them. Now that's really important. If you ignore this tip, you're going to miss catching a soul. So it is extremely important to never debate doctrine. Just ignore it. Ignore it and resume soul winning. 
oh yeah, I believe uh, Mary, yeah, she's the mother of God. And uh, yeah, I believe in Jesus because I believe Mary is the mother of God. And then after that, you go like, oh, okay. Re Revelation, you know, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving. Now, you see what I did? What I did was, is that I did not acknowledge what they said. But I never, it never showed a disagreement with their statement either. I just simply said, okay, meaning, like, I understand. Okay, I got it. And then I just resumed soul winning. Where? Revelation 21, verse 8, or wherever I left off. Wherever you left off in your soul winning, you just resume talking. You just simply said, oh, okay, and then just go blah, 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 like that. So that's the uh, key, is that you never debate doctrine, just ignore it and resume soul winning. You can also say stuff like this. Oh, that's interesting. Well, you know, the Bible says, and then you resume back in soul winning. Sometimes when you say, okay, or that's interesting, it, sh it shows a harmless answer, but it also shows you don't acknowledge or agree with them. And then you go, well, the Bible says, and then it just resumes the subject where you left off. Okay, so 1 Timothy 3.16, it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Now you see that? It says God transformed himself into the flesh. Who is that then? Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Who is this God that transformed himself into flesh, was believed on the world, and then received up into glory, went back up to heaven? That's Jesus, right? So thus you have a verse proving that Jesus is God. This is a famous verse we use in soul winning to prove Jesus is God. Now you might come across a Jehovah Witness or a person who has the wrong Bible that does not have this verse. In fact, wrong Bibles will say he was manifested in the flesh, not God was manifest in the flesh. And that's very important. They, when they got rid of God, that proved Jesus is God, see? So, with the Jehovah Witness, what you can do with their own Bible to prove Jesus is God, you can use this verse. Look at the book of John, chapter 20. John chapter 20. So this is retained in their New World Translation. They never changed this. Look at John chapter 20. And then we'll look at verse 28 through 29. John 20, verse 28 through 29. This one you can use this on a Jehovah Witness, okay? Because it shows right here, Thomas the disciple acknowledged Jesus to be God. Look at verse 28 of John chapter 20. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. So who is he speaking to? Verse 29, Jesus. Jesus, notice in verse 29, he confirmed it. He didn't deny it. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. See that? It's important to believe Jesus is God. Now, there might be some smart Alex, okay? Some smart Alex, so I'm going to add this as a side note. Some smart Alex might say that, well, Thomas was saying that out of excitement, out of shock. <laughs> because if you look at their New World Translation, that's why every punctuation is important in the Bible. In verse 28, notice it ends with a period, my Lord and my God. The Jehovah Witness Bible will have an exclamation point at the end. So it shows that Tom was, Thomas was saying this out of shock. Oh, my Lord and my God, like that. <laughs> so that's how they argue. Now, the simple answer to that is in verse 29, Jesus, why did he confirm and he didn't deny? Plus, if Thomas merely said this out of shock, you know what that was? The penalty for that was in the Old Testament, his Jewish heritage? Stoning to death for taking God's name in vain. And Jesus would have rebuked him. But why did Jesus, at verse 29, affirm it rather than rebuking him? Jesus was saying you should have believed earlier. So that's what's going to work right here. 
Now, the next part, now I highly doubt this, this one is even more rare, okay? So here's the next hurdle. When you discuss Romans 5, 8, and 9, these hurdles are going to be extremely rare. The only thing that's going to be more common is this one, Jesus is God. That's going to be pr a little bit more common. But these hurdles are going to be even more rare. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, when you're discussing that, in the soul winning class I taught you, class 2 and 3, you're supposed to explain them the story that Jesus died, buried, and resurrected. Now, Muslims, they deny that Jesus died. Uh, they only believe in some sort of ascension, probably, or resurrection. And then Jehovah Witnesses, you might not know this, but Jehovah Witnesses, they deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believe that it was only his spirit that resurrected. So in order to debunk that, you use 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then you're going to look at verses... 2 through 3, 1 Corinthians 15, 2 through 3. These verses prove that to be saved is by the death. It specifically says death and then burial and resurrection of Christ. It specifically said those three. So it is important to believe Jesus died, buried, and resurrected. Notice right here in verse 2, by which also ye are what? Saved. So there's something that saved them. What is it? If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. They were saved by what Paul preached to them. Okay, what did Paul preach to them? In verse 3, he preached to them, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, death according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, burial, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, resurrection. So notice right here, uh, I actually wrote up to verse 3. It should be up to verse 4, sorry. 1 Corinthians 15, 2 through 4. Correction, 1 Corinthians 15, 2 through 4. So I apologize. So this verse proves Jesus died, buried, and resurrected. Okay, the next one, we covered... Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 now, okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. Now, in this passage, you might recall in soul winning class 2 and 3, you're supposed to explain to them that good works cannot save them. Now, here's the hurdle you're going to come across on this one. The hurdle you might come across on this one after you explain to them that good works cannot save you only with a repentant heart do you tell God, I trust in the blood of Jesus for my salvation. That's salvation there. When you argue that, there's going to be these different religions who will insist, they are going to insist, and we came across even Catholics who said this. So Catholics are the worst in good works. Then it comes to Jehovah Witness, Seventh-day Adventists, etc. But they will insist they do not believe in works for salvation. That's what they're going to insist. So how are you going to debunk that? There are two ways to debunk this, okay? The first way to debunk this is notice verse 8. What does it say in verse 8? That's the key. Not of what? Yourselves. That's the key right here. Nothing you do saves you. See... I think I taught you this many times, so you disciples got to understand this one. This one is extremely important that you need to know. So I'm going to write here, it's not really a, well, I guess it's a tip, so I'll put it here, tip. They're going to insist they're saved by faith. faith. Lost people will insist they're saved by faith. When clearly they're not, because they rely on some sort of work. So Catholics will say, oh yeah, I believe, I was saved by faith like you too. I believe in salvation by faith, not by works. Then you get confused, and then you go, well, uh, I thought that you believe in observing the sacraments, and then you have to get baptized, and that's part of salvation. What they're going to argue is this. They're going to argue, oh no, uh, we believe 
that because we're saved by the grace of God, His grace will carry us to do baptism and sacraments. That's how they justify it. It's very sneaky. But you tell them this. Basically, what we're saying right here is if you're truly saved by faith and grace, it'll be nothing of yourself. See that? That's how you catch them. Tell them this. Isn't it a work to set up a scheduled date for baptism and, ha and contact someone to baptize you and to observe the sacraments? And I mean, observing the sacraments is work too, if you're going to be honest. A lot of effort you pull on your part. And then you ask them, you can even ask them this. Now, this you don't have to write this down, but if you want to, you can say this too. Ask them what does good works mean to them. See, they probably never thought of that before. They probably never thought of how to define what good works means to them. If baptism and sacraments and living a holy life and cleaning up all your sins is not a work, then what is a work? <laughs> they probably won't be able to explain that one. Now, here's the second tip. Now, this one is even stronger. This verse is like really irrefutable. Go to Romans 11, 6. Romans chapter 11 and verse 6. This is irrefutable, and you can get them on this one. If they insist that baptism is not a work, and believe it or not, I had Church of Christ cultists telling me that baptism is not a work for salvation. They think that's salvation by faith. Now, I don't know where they get the idea from. But that's just so weird. But whether it be a Church of Christ, Catholic, Jehovah Witness, Seventh-day Adventist, they're going to say baptism or sacraments or repent of all sins, which Paul Washer, John MacArthur, and Ray Comfort, they insist that's not good works for salvation. They believe that when you're saved by grace and faith, it's a faith that works. Faith alone, not by works, but nevertheless, faith that works. That's a cute saying they come up with. But no, grace is truly grace without any work involved. And Romans 11 verse 6 proves it. Look at right here, Romans 11 verse 6. And if by grace, then is it what? No more of work. See, that absolutely no work's involved. But it gets better. Otherwise, what? Grace is no more grace. If you insist that some kind of work is involved here, oh, it's a grace that works, a faith that works. No, 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 no. Then you get rid of the meaning of grace. See? Let's keep reading. But if it be of works, now let's insist, let's talk about the definition of works now. If it's works, then what? Then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. You see that? So if they insist that there is something with grace that causes the works or produces work or a faith that produces works, then you get them on Romans 11:6 that, no, these two have to be separated. Otherwise, you get rid of the meaning of grace and you get rid of the meaning of works. See, they not only get rid of the meaning of grace, they even got rid of the definition of what works mean then. See, then you get them on, then what does good works mean? See, there are these silly street preachers who teach about, well, we're not saying salvation by works, salvation by works, but we believe it's a faith that works. And th that is purely demonic because that's what cultists teach too. So look at Romans 11.6 is the second way to handle this. So... These are two ways to handle this hurdle, okay? Now we're at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Okay, now this is probably the hardest hurdle. It's not the hardest to explain in soul winning, okay? When you explain in soul winning, it's short and sweet. But when you come across a hurdle on this one, this can be the toughest subject to cover. So this one I'm going to really cover. This one is extremely important. It's the subject on repentance. Repentance is a very hot debate. Now, remember, I showed you from this verse that repentance is necessary for salvation. So the Bible says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So you explain to them that in order to be saved, repentance is necessary for salvation. So, do you repent as a sinner? Are you sorry for being a sinner? And when you ask them that question, people 
answer easily yes. Now, you'd be surprised, okay? That's how easy salvation is. I mean, repentance is not some kind of work or something that's separated from the gospel. It's part of the simplicity of the gospel, right there. You'd be surprised how many people say yes to that. Because who in their, who in their right mind would obviously say when you're witnessing to them that, I love my sin, I want to hang on to it, and no, rarely, mostly, mostly, it's people who will normally say yes. They're not happy about lying, stealing, cheating, and stuff like that. But you're going to com come across a hurdle here. And the hurdle is they don't know the limitations of repentance. So that's the problem here, the limitations. There is too extreme in these boundaries of limitations. And I taught this in my many videos. So this one you need to know. This is really important for you soul winners. The, these two heresies you should note is lordship salvation. And then there's a, another heresy called easy believism. Now what do these two heresies teach? Now actually I hesitate to use these two terms. The reason why is this, is because um, I do believe that to be saved, to believe in Jesus Christ is very easy. All right, so I think the better term is weak believism. That's the better way to do it. But anyway, or false believism. But anyway, uh, I'm going to use a term that's popularly known. Lordship salvation. Well, no, I do believe that you have to believe Jesus is Lord. So Jesus is God. That's necessary for your salvation. But in this one, they believe that he has to be Lord of all, Lord of everything. So for this one, I would, I would like to say this one concerning about cleaning up all your sins for salvation. That's the idea. That would be the right thing to say. But let's just use these two popular terms. Okay, now what is Lordship Salvation? Lordship Salvation, they basically believe this, is that there should be some sort of significant change. So basically, after you receive Christ for salvation, if you're smoking, drinking, and dancing, then you must not be saved. You are definitely lost. Why? Because those sins were not repented of. That's what they insist and argue. Easy believism, their heresy, is that sin has nothing to do with the picture at all. There is absolutely nothing that has to do with the repentant heart concerning your sinful condition. They believe absolutely no sin is involved in this picture here. Now, the simple answer to debunk these two, so how you define repentance and find the limitations is found in this balance. This is very simple right here, okay? So first of all, in order to explain this part, how we argue right here, is look at the very next verse. That's the key right there. Very next verse. Look at verse 11. It gives many different examples of how you can repent. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11. Well, what's the limitation of repentance right here? You know what the simple answer to that is? There is no limitation. It doesn't matter however way you want to repent. That's the simple truth. The key is this, as long as there is a change of mind concerning your sinful condition. That's the key. Now, I don't know if you know what repent means. That's what repent means. Repent simply means, it's three simple words, change of mind. That's all it means. It means a change of mind. Well, up to what point there is a change of mind? It doesn't matter. If there is a conviction over it, if there is sorrow over it, if there is a point where you even want to clean up your sin, or a desire to do what is right, or a determination to live a clean life, the key is this, it doesn't matter, as long as there is a change of mind over your sinful condition. Because look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 11. Verse 11. For behold this selfsame thing, that he sorrowed after a godly sort, Okay, now remember, what is this sorrowing after a godly sort? Verse 10, remember? Repentance, godly sorrow, worketh repentance. 
When you have that, here are the signs of it, the signs of repentance. What carefulness it wrought in you. See, you'd be a little bit more careful when you're doing sin. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. You would even clear up yourself on your sins. Yea, what indignation. See, you get frustrated about your sin. Yea, what fear. See, you get a little more scared and guilty about doing wrong. Yea, what vehement desire. See, you have a desire to do what is right. Yea, what zeal. You have a zeal to like, I'm going to live a holy Christian life. Yea, what revenge. You want to pay back against your sin. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. See that? So it doesn't matter as long as there's a change of mind. There's a change of mind. Here's where you catch them where they get a wrong salvation in these two areas, okay? Where you get them wrong on these two areas, I'm going to show you two simple verses. Now, I think I'm going a little bit strong right here, but just in, in case. Look at Jonah. Look at the book of Jonah. Jonah. Here's the thing right here. When there's a change of mind concerning their sinful condition, where you get them at where it becomes a problem concerning this limitation is that they depend Remember right here, oh, not of yourselves. If they depend on their efforts, if they depend upon their efforts for their salvation, that's wrong. What happens is this. When there's a change of mind concerning their sinful condition, limitations don't really matter, however they do it. But the thing is this, is that when they have a change of mind, what happens? They realize it's not of themselves, so they turn to Jesus Christ they believe on Jesus Christ. They realize, God, I am a wreck. I am a wretched sinner. I'm sorry. I'm convicted. And whatever I do cannot save me. Whatever I do cannot save me. All I can do is trust in the blood of your son to take care of my sin problem. See, that's why repentance is before belief. Why? You believe on Jesus so his blood can get rid of your sins but how can you trust in the blood to get rid of your sins if you don't have a change of mind to have your sins rid of see that's the simple answer right there look at 2 Corinthians 7 10 again for godly sorrow worketh repentance unto what salvation see that it's a change of mind that leads them to salvation. But if they have a change of mind where they depend upon themselves to take care of it, then that becomes a major problem. See that? That's where lordship salvation demands. See that? Oh, there's something you have to do. And then you get them on this. You go back to these hurdles. No, Ephesians 2, 8 said, not of yourselves. Yourself, yourself, yourself. Well, it's a grace, God's grace that enables you. No, it's not of yourself. But Romans 11, 6 made it very clear, right? No works produced from grace uh, connected. You have to separate it. But look at Jonah 3, verse 10. Jonah 3, verse 10. Lordship salvation insists you have to turn from your sin. You have to clean up your sin. There has to be a definite significant change in your life. No, look at this one, Romans, uh, Jonah, excuse me, not Romans, Jonah 3, 9, Jonah 3, 9. Who can tell if God will turn away and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their what? Works. What's defined as works? That they turn from their what? Evil way. You can't get around that verse. You got Lordship Salvationists with this one. I don't care how many PhDs, these Lordship Salvationists, they're pretty smart with the Bible. How you get them on that is Jonah 3.10. There is no way around that. See, it's nothing you do, nothing you can do. All, you're helpless. You turn to the cross of Jesus. Repentance should make you turn to the cross, not something you do with yourself. Now, easy believism, see, their problem is this. They want to get rid of any limitation at all. Easy believism, 
believe sin has nothing to do with the picture here. So completely get rid of conviction over sin, absolutely. But look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Romans 2. Now, I disagree with them on that because the Bible says godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. So there is conviction involved there. But some of these smart Alex, they would say, well, godly sorrow is the end result from repentance. It's not repentance itself. Blah, blah, blah. They like to talk like that. I disagree with them on that, but I'm not going to cover all the arguments to debunk it. Okay? I'm just going to give you, make this simple because we're making this simple, okay, to cover the hurdles. Look at Romans chapter 2, and then notice what the Bible says right here at verse 4, Romans 2, 4. Or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to what? Repentance. Okay, these people, God wants to repent. But look how it's more explained in verse 4. Uh, verse 5, excuse me. But after, see, contrary to leading to repentance, contrary to that, they want to do something else. After thy hardness and what? Impenitent heart. See that? See, people don't want to have a repentant heart. They want to have an impenitent heart. Impenitent, that means no conviction, no sorrow, no guilt over their sin, etc., so notice Romans 2, 4, God wants these people to repent. But in Romans 2, 5, these people refuse to have a repentant heart. They have an impenitent heart. See that? Instead of a penitent heart, they have an impenitent heart. Instead of a repentant heart, they have an impenitent heart. See, so you use Romans 2. So for here, you use Jonah 3. And then here, you use Romans 2 where people think that there's no limitations to that, okay? So that's how you get them on that. Now, here's the next hurdle. The next hurdle is this. Now, that one was really apologetics here, okay? This one I didn't cover at all. Now, that's shocking, okay? I want to tell people online this. I talked to hundreds, maybe thousands of people, and I never came across this hurdle. The only time I came across this hurdle was with saved believers or heretics. And that's uh, in church or online. <laughs> that's not soul winning. So this is really rare, okay? This is the more common hurdle you're going to come across. When you ask them, now remember, in soul winning class 2 and 3, you tell them, so do you repent as a sinner? Or are you sorry for being a sinner? The hurdle is this. The hurdle is they think it's hard. Or they think they can't. Because they love gambling. They love drinking. They love their homosexual lifestyle. In fact, I had one homosexual ask me that question. Does that include homosexuality? And I obviously said yes. See, sin is sin. But here's the thing right here. Is that dealing with these people, see... I came across one person who was about to go gamble, but then before he was going to go gamble and drink, and I showed him the gospel, he says, well, I can't. I want to gamble, etc. You know what you emphasize? You, remember, is repentance hard or easy? It should be easy, right? Not hard. So you got to explain to them this way. Now, remember this one, right? This is the key right here. Repentance unto salvation. That is extremely important. Not of yourselves. That's extremely important. That's how you get them. So I tell them this. I tell them simply, yeah, you're right. It is. I can understand that. I'm not telling you to stop gambling or to for, uh, quit drinking or homosexuality, etc. Because... We all sin, and we're very capable of sinning. But, here's the thing. God even told you you can't do it yourself, see? So I'm not telling you to do anything yourself. I'm telling you to turn it to Jesus Christ at the cross, see? So have the conviction over your sin where you want God to get rid of the sins for you. You can't do it yourself. It's God. So in, so in explanation right here, how you get to them is to make repentance simple and easy. You tell them... 
that there's nothing you can do yourself. I'm not telling you yourself to stop the gambling, the homosexuality and all that. I'm just simply telling you, let God get rid of it for you. That's why Jesus died for you with his blood. Turn it over to him. All I'm asking you is that you have a repentant heart as a sinner. You are convicted over your sin that you turn it over to God to get rid of it for you. See? That's what happens. Not what you do. It's what God does. And as a matter of fact, after salvation, after you get saved, that's what God actually does. He chastises his children to get them in the right path. He makes them reap what they sow. He gives them the conviction of the Holy Spirit within that grieves them over their sin. See, etc., etc. So that's how you make it simple for them. And guess what? I caught that homosexual to salvation. I even got a guy who was about to do cocaine. It was like right in front of my face, man. <laughs> he had it right in front of his lap. And then when I told him that, he got saved after that. So that's how you deal with them. This is the common <laughs> hurdle in repentance, okay? So there are two things that way critics don't get on us. One, we don't make false conversions where we have a homosexual in front of us or a crack addict in front of us, and then we get them to do the prayer, get them to believe on Jesus, and then they go back to their business of fornication and cocaine again. See, no, that will be a bad reputation for us. No, we don't give conversions like that. We, we believe in repentance. But we also, so that we don't get a bad reputation, we don't tell people that they have to stop this sin and that sin and repent of all sins. We don't do that either. They can't. It's not what they do. God has to do it for them. Jesus got rid of their sins with his blood. And guess what? God helps them after even their salvation as well. But guess what? Here's something you got to understand. Is that when you go by yourself to get rid of the sin problem, you're in hard ground right here because, let's be honest, even the most holy man, no matter how much you do it yourself, you're still going to sin. No matter how holy you are. I mean, even in thought life, see? So, that's, so it's easy. Just simply point out, remember, repentance unto salvation, see? Where you have a repentant heart over your sinful condition that you can't help it, you can't do anything yourself, so you turn to the cross of Jesus. You trust in His blood. It's not of yourselves. All right. Now, oh, yikes. Okay, I'm going to have to cover this in next class, so I apologize. Next class is going to be important. It has to do with um, two classes ago about the importance of being involved in a Bible-believing movement and not to, be, uh, not to be divisive, not to be separated from that. That's an important basis for discipleship. But uh, I'm going to explain next class the importance of consistently maintaining that Bible-believing movement. Not only are you supposed to overlook imperfections, but also you're supposed to stand for right doctrine. There are a lot of Bible believers who are compromising, befriending this guy, befriending that guy. Oh, they're all imperfect, but we can get along. No, 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 there's a limitation here. We have to maintain the purity of right doctrine and not compromise. But I'm going to explain that kind of balance at next class. So that's going to be very salient, okay? So then I guess your homework assignment then will be to cover the hurdles, okay? So again, uh, if you fell behind in soul winning, practice your soul winning. Okay, that is the number one priority for people who fell behind. Practice your soul winning. Don't worry about the hurdles, okay? If you practice hurdles now, trust me, it's not going to really do you much good. It's not going to, I rarely came across these, okay? I rarely came across these. So, uh, practice your soul winning. That's the more important thing. And then if you know your soul winning, if you did it well, then cover the hurdles, okay? Cover the hurdles. If I were you, I'd write them in my Bible, your soul winning Bible. That way you can know which verses to turn to, uh, which arguments to use, right? Miniature arguments in that one. So major your soul winning and cover the hurdles well. So since we have a little bit more time then, I'm going to cover the last hurdle, which is Romans 10.9, okay? Romans 10.9. Now, the hurdle is this in Romans 10.9. The hurdle with this one is that there's actually no hurdle at all, okay? The conclusion will be the hurdle, not Romans 10.9. Romans 10.9, there's hardly any hurdle at all. The only thing you have to specify, though, now, it's actually covered in class number two or class number three. 
So in reality, you don't actually have to write this down right now because I already covered it. But the only hurdle you're going to come across is you got to make sure they understand prayer doesn't save them, okay? Repeating a prayer doesn't save them. Now, there are some people who attack the sinner's prayer, and they'll say that's not necessary for salvation. I beg to differ. Romans 10.9 and Romans 10.13, you got to do that, okay? That's necessary for the gospel. It's like repentance. They're not... Belief is the basis for salvation, but these two, they are, they are prerequisites. As much as hell is a prerequisite, Jesus is God is a prerequisite, etc. But aside from that one, the hurdle you're going to come across is that you come across the people who believe that repeating after word, uh, repeating the words after you in a prayer is what saves them. So that's the hurdle that you want to stress. You got to stress to them repeating a prayer doesn't save you. You got to make them understand that. What saves you is that you believe in every word and that these words you're saying are your words, not mine. So you got to make them understand that. Make them understand that they've got to believe every word and pretend those are their words, not mine. When you mention that part, then they'll get the memo. You don't have to go in a long explanatory process for 10 minutes about you know the sinner's prayer. You don't have to do that. Just let them know. Repeating these words does not save you. Pretend these are your words. You've got to believe every word. Otherwise, it amounts to nothing. Then they'll get it. And that's actually a very easy hurdle. The conclusion is the greatest hurdle. The conclusion. Where they say that they are not ready to get saved. And that is the most common hurdle, actually, out of everything we covered. And we'll cover that in our next class. Okay? In our next class, I'll tell you how you can get the person to get convicted and then to get saved and not put it off. Heavenly Father, dismiss us now with your blessing. I pray today's discipleship was a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only 
on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.